There's two kind of mar uh, Okay, I'm going to show a couple nightmares, and I'm going to show two uh, white cataracts, which you deal with all the time. But the first patient is very young. He's 16. He's got chronic iridocyclitis, and he is uh, been on steroids for three years in this one eye. You see the diflupredne. His other eye is 2020. And he comes to me, his mother is an optometrist. Is there any way you can squeeze him in? Because he has to be taking his SAT, this is the college entrance exam in the United States. <coughs> we need him to have his surgery as soon as possible. So he's 16. Here is the topography here. And he's got 1.66 axis is 15. So the plan, you know, the mother and I, we say, okay, a toric IOL makes sense in this 16-year-old. Uh, so here is the uh, white lens. And I think uh, many different ways deal with that. So we'll just start off here. And I like still <clears throat> using an air bubble to stain the capsule. But the trick is you have to keep the cannula touching the anterior capsule surface because the dye will pull due to capillary action right along the cannula. And that increases the contact time between the dye and the anterior capsule. So you see I just move it back and forth like a paintbrush. And that will intensify the dye. <clears throat> now how many people would just make a little... Um, aspirate the cortex in this child, or how many people would just go ahead and start the uh, capsular axis? That's what I'm doing here. Got plenty of viscoelastic in, and uh, right around here, uh, I'm doing fine. I'm going to come out, put a little more viscoelastic in, and then switch to the forceps, right? So I always put a little, little more viscoelastic in, low scleral rigidity. Now I'm going to go to the forceps, and before I know it, wow, it went all the way out. So now we've got, this is not quite an Argentinian flag because it didn't go all the way to the other side, but I'm going, gosh, a 16-year-old, and the mother is an optometrist, wants a toric lens. Okay, so audience, what do we do here? Okay, um, any suggestions? How many people would convert it to a can opener and, and just get this out? Can opener? All right. Try to try to continue it, like here. All right. So complete. So make a new cut and and go around. All right. Well, we're going to try to do that. So I like using these MST capsule forceps because you can go through a side port. But there's a lot of tension, as you know, from intralenticular. So this is the Brian Little capsule tear out rescue maneuver. I'm pulling backward to create tension to try to turn the tear inward. So pull it back from the direction you're coming, trying to make a left hand turn. I'm putting a lot of traction on it. And you really have to pull because this is very elastic. It's a combination of elasticity. Here's the tear. You see it right along here now, and I'm re-grabbing. And of course, the problem is going through the incision is tough because not only would I have the bad angle of approach, but I will burp all the viscoelastic out. So I love having these uh, forceps that come through the side. And slowly but surely, I am able to turn it. And so at least I prevented it from going all the way back out. And that was a good suggestion then to try to tear it. Now, okay, so we'll continue with the cataract. Uh, you know, there's no nucleus here in an 18-year-old. And I like using bimanual INA anytime I have any kind of capsule or tear problem. Uh, I think that I can dissociate the irrigation, the aspiration. So my irrigation is up high. My aspiration is inside the capsular bag. And uh, of course, with the uveitis, I need to get all the cortex out. I'm even going to vacuum the undersurface of the anterior capsule to remove as many of the lens epithelial cells as possible. Now, here's the thing. There's no scleral rigidity. So when I come out, I have to pressurize the globe so I can switch hands. Maybe it's not necessary, but what am I afraid of? I'm afraid of the chamber shallowing, the hyaloid coming forward, and possibly having the tear wrap around. So you notice every time I want to come out, I, I stop. All right, so we got away with it. And now the question is, what IOL? Remember, the patient we had decided maybe a toric IOL. 
So how many people would go ahead and put the Toric IOL with this large open capsule in there? How many people would put something besides a Toric IOL in? All right, so that's most people. Now, if I was to put the Toric IOL in, you see the axis, 15 degree axis here. Where would the haptic be? Who knows where the haptic would be? So that's the trick, right? We always put the Toric IOL in. We don't really pay much attention to the haptic. But here, you need to actually know where the haptic will sit. Will it, I mean, will the haptic sit over here? That would be very bad. Would it sit over here? That would be very safe. Who knows? All right. So who would put in, who would put in this lens in the sulcus? Who would put in a non-toric single piece in the bag? So that would be most people, because you always do LASIK, right? All right. How many people would put a toric in the bag? Anybody? Negative. Negative. Not a good idea. All right. How many people would like to see me put in a toric in the bag? <laughs> all right. You want, all right. So here's the thing. The toric IOL, the axis is right at the optic-haptic junction. So knowing that, this tells me in advance that the haptic will sit over here. And of course, you know, with a single piece acrylic, it can open very slowly, uh, and you have plenty of time. What you don't want to do is have any rotational force on the capsule. So a three-piece in the bag would be dangerous because that would push on the, the, the capsule. And the single most forceful maneuver causing a wraparound tear is rotation on the, for, uh, on the, on the uh, within the capsule bag, either the nucleus or a three-piece. So you see the axis is here, and basically all I need to do is turn it, and you see the haptic is nowhere near there, and that was the idea. And sometimes when I'm doing a, an advanced technology IOL and a young person, they have, they have their heart set on it, even though it may not be ideal, I don't think there's a harm necessarily to try it if it's important. Now here, Toric IOL, you can always do LASIK, I agree. Because you can always take that lens out, as long as the posterior capsule's intact. But this, for the 16-year-old, is his one chance to have a Toric IOL. All right, so we got the lens in, it looks good. I haven't done anything yet. Now what about, what do we have to worry about in a young patient with uveitis? Posterior synechiae. Do we have to worry at all about the capsule here? Would anyone, anyone suggest what we, should we remove some of that capsule, I guess, right? Because what we have to worry about, of course, is posterior synechiae to the anterior capsule. And normally when I do a uveitis patient, I go out of my way to not leave the capsular excess too small. I go back and enlarge it. And what I've got here is, you know, no capsule in two area, in one area, but a very small capsulotomy. Any suggestions? Would anyone enlarge the capsule? Okay, a few people. How many people think that's a little too risky, especially with a toric lens in the eye? So I can't disagree, but um, it, I basically go ahead now and let's see what happens. These are the small micro scissors. And I, uh, the, the key is the instrumentation. So you notice that I'm coming in through the side port. I'm not losing the chamber. I have the viscoelastic. And I, I just want to make it a little bit bigger so his pupil isn't resting right over the capsule edge. Now here, I have to do the same thing. It's a thin teenage capsule. I have to pull backward from the direction I'm coming when I want. See how it wants to spiral out there? It wants to go outward. So when I need to, I pull back from the same direction I'm coming, and that puts tension on it. And then I get it tense, and then I turn it to the right. All right, you can see the stress on there. But by pulling backward in this direction, that's keeping it taut. It's keeping it tense, and that maintains the, the control. And knowing that, and being pretty confident in that, I can go ahead, and now I, I, I have a much better sized rexus. Now what about this side? Well, so far, so I'm living dangerously, but you know, here, this is really a test of the difficult rexus. It's no longer an intumescent lens. It's a thin capsule in a young patient. See the traction? But it's not pulling on the zonules. It's actually just stretching the capsule. 
And by doing that, I'm just hoping that by removing some of that excess anterior capsule, we're going to lessen the chance of his developing posterior synechii. But I am holding my breath, because if this does tear out, I may no longer be able to position my toric lens uh, adequately. So, so we go a little further, and now I'm ready to do my final positioning here at the 15 degree axis, maybe leave it a little under rotated till it's gone. And the, uh, the important thing is, again, being very gentle on the rotation. Rotation is the single most forceful maneuver that we do. Rotation of something in the bag, usually the nucleus. And when you have a wraparound tear, most of the time, I think, it's the rotation of the nucleus of the IOL that causes that, okay? So here we got away with it. The lens is good. So postoperatively, plenty of difluprednate. We tapered it. and. Uh, he eventually got a good result. He was, you know, obviously needed reading glasses. Uh, and uh, when I last checked with him, he, he was, uh, got a good score on his college test, got into UC Berkeley, and is studying pre-med. Now let's show another white cataract here. The difference here is an older patient. He's 55, rapid loss of vision. That's not, ref you know, he's self-referred. No history of trauma, pretty simple case. His other eye is 2040, but he already shows some anterior cortical cataract in his other eye. So I'm just assuming this is bilateral congenital cataracts. Of course, this eye is his light perception. So let's start his case. Now, same thing, I like to you know, paint the surface with the dye. Want to see if anyone notices anything different. I mean, am I doing so, so far so good at painting the anterior surface? So far, right? You guys see any, anything that I should be doing differently? Again, the bubble displaces the dye off the anterior surface. Is there uh, something, uh, you know, the bubble is decentered, so... The bubble's decentered. Uh, maybe the eye's tilted? Maybe the eye's tilted a little? The bubble is pretty decentered there. Why do you think it's decentered? Is there vitreous there? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little worried about that. Now, so see all that? So I'm just going to push it all to the side. And I'm thinking, let me push that out of the way. And I guess while I've got it in there and I got the dye, let me at least make the rexus. But I think that is definitely vitreous there. So although he's told me there's, there's no history of trauma, this went from a simple white cataract to now I've got vitreous prolapsing through. So we get that done. Okay, let me see what this is. Okay, it's, I don't need triamcinolone. It's, it's tripan blue stained vitreous. Okay, now what? So we got vitreous prolapse. We got the white lens. All right, so here's the choices. We can push the viscoelastic and then try to phaco very cautiously. We could do a vitrectomy, and if so, do we go through the limbus of the pars plana? Okay. So, how, how many people would proceed with FACO very carefully, pushing the vitreous aside, but going very carefully? How many people would push the vitreous aside with viscoelastic and proceed not very carefully? <laughs> All, right. All right. How many people would do a vitrectomy, but you would do it through the limbus? How many people would do first a vitrectomy and do it through the pars plana? So a couple of people with the pars plana. Okay. Panel? What would you do? Vitrectomy first? I would, first. I, I would do a vitrectomy. I would, uh, you know, go from the uh, two side ports and, uh, I mean, limbal root, and I would, uh, you know, remove this vitreous which is in the anterior chamber and then uh, use visco to keep it away. And during the surgery, if I required, I would do that again, and I would put a capsular hook there to ensure it doesn't come back. Great. Dr. Sashtev, would you do a pars plana or a limbus for the vitrectomy? I think it's better to do from the pars plana and then uh, follow it up with a capsular tension ring. Okay. All right. So pars plana, we had a couple. So that would be an approach. Um, one of the troubles, though, is, you know, when you do the pars plana, I usually like to see the, the tip, and this would be pretty tough, right? We can't see it. So for that reason... I'm going to go ahead and do it through the, the limbus. 
So here I'm going through the limbus, get a separate infusion. I don't need capsule dye. I keep my tip pointed away from the anterior capsular edge. And I'm just trying to excise enough of this so we can wall it off, proceed with phaco, and not aspirate vitreous with the phaco tip. So here's my bimanual cutting. And uh, I think pars plane is a good idea, but I just didn't feel comfortable here since I, I can't see the tip of it. You could go blindly, but all right. So now I'm using a dispersive viscoelastic. Dispersive because it stays where you put it. It kind of forms a wall. We kind of going to wall that off. And now we'll just remove this. And what I'm going to do is try to get it out of the bag and hold it over to the left-hand side. I keep my phaco tip away from the area where we know we have the zonular dialysis. So I keep it way to the side. I'm cutting over here. So far, so good. And I make sure there's always some... Uh, lens material at the tip. I'm using a small tip. I'm trying to stay away from there. And I'm pretty excited because so far it looks like there's no vitreous. So I do what? I put in some viscoelastic. I come out. I put in the triamcinolone. And what do you think? There's a ton of vitreous there. I am pretty lucky that I didn't uh, aspirate that all. All right. So now we got lots of vitreous. We got cortex. So, how many people would just, again, push it as a side and do the INA first? How many people would do a vitrectomy now? And we got a choice. We got anterior vitrectomy, raise your hand. We've got a pars plane of vitrectomy, raise your hand, please. So, half and half. Guys, pars plana. So that is, in fact, the reason pars plana would, would have been better because, you see, when you go anterior, you keep pulling it forward, right? You pull it into the anterior chamber. It's hard to get rid of it. So let's go ahead. So 3.5 millimeters back I'm going. I'm going to mark here. I'm going to take down with the, uh, the cautery. I'm going to basically go in there. I'm going to cut, 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 cut. All right, so now I go 3.5 back because I'm not actually going perpendicular sclera. I'm coming in tangentially. I put the infusion in the front, that's at the limbus. You can see that the cutting here, there was a little movement of that vitreous in the anterior chamber. I know I've been nibbling on the other side of it, on the other side of the dialysis. So now I can go back in from the front. I know it's already been disconnected, and there it comes out. All right, so, so far, so good. And now we can go, we've got that vitreous out, we can go back now. Remember bimanual INA? Well, I think the reason I like it here is I can dissociate the irrigation aspiration, so, so I'm less likely to have my irrigation go through the dialysis, which we know he has that probably traumatic dialysis. Again, before I swap hands, I'm going to put viscoelastic in the capsular bag, stabilize it, then I get the other cortex out, this time I'm coming through a third port, a third incision to get that subincisional because it's kind of um, chalky, the cortex. It's not soft. And all right, now what, what's this round thing here? What is that round thing right there? So I'm not feeling too good at this point. Trimsilon, is it? You think? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, there was a little. Just so you can tell. There was a tiny round circle there. See it? Right here. So, so I heard PC rent? Okay. Don't you think this was a congenital posterior capsule defect and that's why he had the white lens? No. Just kidding. Um, yeah, that's a PC rent. And where did the PC rent come from? The vitractor. Exactly. So when I went in and I'm trying to do as you suggested the pars plana anterior vitrectomy. We don't need to go too far back. What was different about this? I'm used to doing it when the capsule is already torn. And here's a case where we didn't have a torn capsule. We had a zonular dialysis and I filled the bag with viscoelastic, pushing the posterior capsule back, making it much easier uh, to do that. So what do we do now? Do we put in a ca capsule? We have a zonular dialysis, right? And we have this little hole in the posterior capsule. So should we put in a capsule tension ring with a zonular dialysis? How many people think we need a capsule tension ring? Okay. You should have put it earlier. You should. 
Now you tell me. Now you tell me. Now it needs a glue dye. Well, if Amar was here, you know, it would be straight away glue dye. How many people would put the lens in the, well, could we put in a uh, Malugin CTR or how about the capsule tension segment? Would that work? That would enlarge the break in the PC because it's not like a continuous curve. We're enlarging thing. the break. All right. Then we have a couple choices. Do we, what lens do we put in? This is a young patient. He's got astigmatism. We had talked about a toric lens. Can we put in a toric lens in him without the CTR? Better not, huh? Okay, you're worried about tilt. All right. So should we, how many people would put a three-piece monofocal in the back? I, I would capture it, actually. You want to go in the sulcus? I would put it in the sulcus and put, capture it. How would we put a one-piece in the back? So we got a lot of those, okay. How many people would put in a Torek because he had about a diopter and a half of cylinder? Nobody. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So this is a three-piece. It happens to be an acrylic lens. I believe it's the AMO Sensar. And I am putting it in the sulcus uh, for just the reason he's got a zonula dialysis. I'm trying to have the haptics away from the rent. And in order to prevent the lens from rotating, I'm going to capture the optic so it later on cannot rotate where the haptic would go through the rent. It has the other advantage of, of course, preventing capsule or excess contracture. So there you see the button holding. We've got it in there. And now we'll put in some uh, Maya call. And we are done, okay? So there you see the capture, you see my little hole here, my primary capsulotomy. He's got the zonal dialysis, uh, but so far so good. Um, do we have time for one more? Or do, you, yes, yes. Do, do one more? Yes. I'll try to run through it quickly. This is a one-eyed patient. This patient is 90 years old. This is her only eye. She's hand motion and she is falling a lot. Why is she one-eyed? Well, two years ago, at the age of 88, she had phaco. There was a supracroidal hemorrhage. She went blind and went tysicle at 88 in the other eye. So she's naturally reluctant in this eye to have surgery, but she is falling a lot. She lives in Nevada, and the doctors there said, don't do surgery, but if you want, there's a person in California we can send you to, see what he thinks. So this is her pupil. And uh, the chamber is deep, the pressure is okay, but I can't really see the iris sphincter. And the, you, you can't see from here, but with a slit lamp, it's not really brown, it's more red. She's 90. And she's had supracortal hemorrhage with phaco in the other eye. So, how many people, how many people tell her, tell her to have surgery? It's not worth it. Raise your hand. How many people would encourage her to have surgery? You know, you have a chance, and I'm going to do it. How many people would encourage her to have surgery, but I'm going to refer you to someone who specializes in exactly this kind of case? All right, a lot of people. All right. So, now here's the question. How many people, if you're going to do it, FACO or extra cap? Okay? Because, you know, she... Okay, how many would do it with FACO? How many would do it with some version of extra cap? Manual, small incision, something like that. I mean, this is, uh, this is a group of surgeons that has that ability. Does the fact that she had a supracoidal hemorrhage concern you? Would you do it... How many people would do a small incision extra cap but not a large incision? Okay. Or how many people now would really say FACO is better because of the supracroidal hemorrhage? And what happens if you drop the nucleus? Would you do an anterior vitrectomy? What would your plan be? How many people, if you did that, would open it up and express the nucleus if you tore the capsule? Versus what? How many people would leave it? and say, I'm not going to open your incision, I'm going to have you go to a vitreoretinal sur surgeon because you have retained lens and an open capsule. So, so these, are, these are sort of the problems. There you are. All right. So here is, sorry, 
Here's the case. Let me just start the video. So the first problem is there's no pupil. There is it, so I'm kind of using a little Sinsky hook. It's blunt, and I'm trying to get under there and sort of lift something up to see if there's a, there's my Lester hook. It's so and actually I'm using a bent 25 gauge needle as a pick to just try to get a little bit I mean there's literally no edge here it's like the uh, the iris fibers end on the lens and so using my needle but turned it sideways I'm just sort of like using it like a retina pick and as soon as I can I go to those forceps and I'm just trying to pry this apart to, to create a little bit, a little bit of a, a, a pupil, because if I have a pupil, at least I think I can get to the lens. So, so far, I, I start to see a little bit of the lens there. I put more viscoelastic in. Can you start to see a little of the pupil there? And I, there's still not enough. So I just decide I'm going to have to sort of cut away some of the tissue just to get toward it. We can now start to see some lens capsule here. Wow, and then I'm holding some iris there because I know that's going to get caught in the phaco tip. So I'm trimming it, trimming it, just to have a little bit. Now I think I have something I can open up with the Malugan ring. So here we go. And then we're going to use this capsule die for sure. The chamber was already pretty deep. And uh, so uh, it was actually a little bit of a, somewhat of a red reflex, although it's, it's really a dense lens. It's not easy to see. So I put this here. Now, can we put in capsule dye now under the viscoelastic? How many people would put in capsule dye now? That's most people, right? So we put in the dye. And I'm just hoping now that we'll be able to visualize the capsule. Now, we put in some viscoelastic. And the only thing as I do this that I'm, I'm a little worried about is there's a little bit of an edge here. You see that edge? Everybody see that? What do you think that is? See, it's a little clear right there. And, and I'm sort of, that looked like a little piece of capsule there. So what, what do you think that, why is there this edge here? Any thoughts? What? So you think it's from it's a tear in the anterior capsule? How many people think it's a tear in the anterior capsule? Oh, this, you guys are cruel. All right. So now what do we do now? Let's review. She lost her other eye two years ago, 88, supracortical hemorrhage, blind. We've gone ahead and encouraged surgery. We're doing the surgery. And we've got a nice pupil, and, and we have a big tear in the anterior capsule. Is it too late to quit? <laughs> How many people would convert to an extra cap? Now remember, she had a supracoroidal hemorrhage and went blind two years ago. How many people would convert to an extra cap? Not too many, or manual sutureless. How many people would try to FACO this? How many people would refer to a vitreal retinal surgeon? How many people would say, I know just the person that specializes in exactly this kind of problem to refer you to? Hopefully All right. right. Ten minutes. So we got a torn anterior capsule. So what I basically did is I put in more dye right in that area, try to see what's going on. And uh, we'll, we'll try to uh, expand it. So we'll make a little tear. And so I'm going to make my cut there. So, and then, of course, just re-tearing it. And what, what, what you'll see is basically that with more dye, we at least get an edge there. We've got a larger pupil. And I think the key is just get plenty of this opening here. Now, the whole topic of how to do a dense lens with an open capsule is a whole other issue. We basically want to avoid uh, rotating the lens. You know, in the interest of time, I'm not really going to show all of that, except here at the end. We've got it out. Capsule's intact. And then, uh, again, just in the interest of time, putting in a three-piece foldable lens so we don't have to open up the incision in the sulcus 
And even though we have a large defect here, we, we, we created and we did everything. So I think normally converting to an extra cap would be a really smart thing to do, you know, particularly with the risk with wraparound tear, but with, with the suprachoidal uh, hemorrhage, didn't want to do that, and I want to speed this up. And that, that's really the end of the case. So I thank you very much. And uh, our last speaker is Dr. Luther. Thank you very much.